Well, good morning, church. Um, it's great to be with you this morning. We've come out of a series called uh, Without a Doubt. We're still going to be in Luke here, but uh, the Lord's put in our hearts to move this this idea of taking what we know now about Jesus Christ and still learning those things, but now pursuing God because of them. So as you saw in the video, you and I are in pursuit of God with each other. It changed when Jesus made himself known to us. It just did. And if you're not a believer this morning, it does that. When Jesus makes himself known to you, your priorities change. The pursuits of this life change. You become one who is now pulled to the things of God. What does that look like? Why are we pulled to the things of God this way? What defines that for our lives? I was thinking a lot about the first time I got something other than a banana seat bike. I'm that old. I got a banana seat bike when I was a kid. And I remember quickly trying to transform this bike into something that looked like a BMX bike. And it was just really a poor excuse for a bike. But I was blessed with a, a Schwinn 10-speed, I think, back in the day. And the family got bikes. So we were going to do some bike riding together on a few trails and enjoy that in the Riverside area. So we got bikes together. And I remember now getting up on a bike that was a little bit taller, a little different profile of a bike. And the tires were super skinny. That was my problem, right? I was like, is this really going to hold me up? The tires were super skinny. So I got on that street and I decided to get on that bike. And there was a fear in me. I was young enough that there was a fear in me in riding this bike a bit. And as I looked ahead, I knew that there was ground to cover with a bike, but I looked ahead and I happened to have acorn trees in front of my house. So there was acorns all over the street. Unless the, sweeps, uh, the, the street sweeper came by, they were there. And I remember not even pedaling my bike, but I got it to a coast trying to figure out how to balance this bike. And I realized I'm no longer pedaling, and I was headed right towards an acorn. And it was me versus the acorn. I know this sounds ridiculous, but I remember this ingrained in my head. And I stared at that acorn. And I said, don't hit the acorn. And I came up because I'm coasting just a little bit. And guess what I did? I hit the acorn. And what happened at that point? I fell. I bailed. I hit the bike on the ground. And I thought to myself, I can't do this. I stared at the acorn. A couple things that I learned about that. Number one, to be able to balance on a bike, you have to have momentum forward. You, you, I've seen people do that. They, they do tricks and stuff. But all the while, that can only last so long. It's a balancing act. To be able to truly balance on a bike, you have to have forward movement. And in that forward movement, where we slow down is when we start to look at the complications of this life, the trials, the tribulations. I'm going to talk about something that is separate from that, that, that Christ calls us to. But there's just, no matter where we're at in this life, whether a Christian or not, there's trials and there's tribulations. We just go through stuff financially, with our health and relationships, it's just going to help him. It's just going to happen. It's what it is. But when I fixed myself, my, my gaze upon the problem, I begin to slow down, worry about the problem, and the thing that I worried about so much became the ultimate issue for me. I fell. I hit the ground. I was thinking about that. And if you watch this last video, thank you so much, Jackson, for creating it for me. This really kind of captures the idea. It doesn't matter how life is busy and where people's pursuits are. And you know the masses are running down a very wide road. It's about the one who's fixed their gaze straight forward. And their intent is to pursue God no matter what. No matter what it costs them. And I didn't say all the problems in this life will dictate how we pursue God. No, 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 no. We don't get to shape our life and say, well, there's this lot that's been given to me. No, no, no. That's, that's just the worries and concerns of this life that Jesus says to, to, to be able to take on his yoke and let all that stuff go, go, go to the wayside. I'm talking about a pursuit that no matter what, as a Christian, no matter what as a Christian, wherever you're at in life, we all are called to this pursuit. It's a pursuit of God himself. So much of us, uh, so many of us get distracted in so many ways. Our pursuits, because, uh, because of a job situation or a relationship is, is situation, we begin focusing on that acorn. When all the while, the focus should still be in the pursuit, sh pursuit should still be God. Amen. Those, those things take us off of what we're supposed to be doing on a daily basis. 
without a doubt, because we know these things, what is it like now to trust that? Trust what we know. Well, here's what, here it is, Luke 9. And uh, we're going to give context along the way. We're going to be able to do some things, particularly with this scripture, that maybe you've, or see some things that we've never ever seen before because of what Jesus does with his disciples, the words he uses. Luke 9, and I'll be starting in verse 28 if you want to follow along to verse 36. And then we're going to kind of be in the midst of the context of this scripture. And here it is, the word of the Lord this morning for us. Luke 9, starting at verse 28. About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see. And they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. When they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were starting to leave, Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them, and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Then a voice from a cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell anyone at the time what they had seen. Father, we come to you today and continue, uh, Lord, continue to pull us into the things that we need to know and understand about your word. More importantly, Lord, continue to allow us to know the truth of this word in a new, fresh way. It's very often we've read these scriptures, Lord, and we could read it and be like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the transfiguration, or that's that story, and I've read it a hundred times. But to allow the world, word to penetrate our hearts this morning, that it would shed light on the world that surround, surrounds us, the, the decisions we make on a day, daily basis on how to engage that world, and the relationship that we should have with you on a continual basis with all that in mind. And then the outflow is how we relate with others, the relationships we now have with each other. So God, in this moment, be very clear to our hearts. May, may I, Lord, be able to give a word today that, that they understand that comes from you that you would, by the power of the Holy Spirit, communicate this to their hearts today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This is known as the transfiguration. I want to start in a place, because Jesus does, or Luke does particularly about Jesus, and he says these words in verse 28. About eight days later. That was key. I thought, what was happening in those days prior well, this is what was happening. There, was, there were these moments that Jesus had with the disciples. Peter had just declared because Jesus asked, who do people say I am? Then who do you say I am? And they were saying that it's John the Baptist possibly back from the dead or that he is uh, Elijah. And Peter blurts out, you are the Christ. So he confesses with his mouth that Jesus is the Messiah. And in that same moment, Jesus begins to, in, particularly in Matthew, Matthew 16, Peter declares uh, this, this, this two-word phrase, almost like, surely not. And it's a response to what Jesus now begins to tell him about being a Messiah. And that was the Messiah would have to go and die, but that he would be raised on the third day, and he'd live again. So Jesus begins to inform his disciples about what it's going to look like in the near future for him, what needs to take place, my death and my resurrection. And then, of course, Peter there, and again, we, we treat Peter like somehow he says all the wrong things when we ourselves probably would have been the same people. Surely not. And there's this great rebuke back to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Whoa. I mean, there, there must have been something tense going on in that relationship. I, I kind of figure Peter at that point is, is kind of cowering down, like, what did I just do wrong? I don't, I don't understand, and yet Jesus has rebuked me. This was, the, 
This was how tense the conversation was eight days ago. But then something else transpires as a result. He says, if anyone were to come after me, if anyone were to pursue me, it looks like this. They must turn. Say turn with me this morning. From your selfish ways. Then take, say take with me. Up your cross daily. Say daily. And follow. Say follow. Jesus. Try to hold on to your life, he says, and you will lose it. But if you give up your life for Jesus' sake and come after me, you will gain it. Jesus had just declared to Peter, I must go here. I must die. I will head towards Jerusalem, and that journey is going to be difficult, but I will die. But then I will be raised again. This is what the Messiah has to do. And then he begins to tell them, if you were to follow that Messiah... This is what the Messiah has to do. This is what the Messiah will be doing. I, if you, I am the Messiah and you've declared it, this is what's going to be happening. This is how you follow me. And he says, deny yourself. D deny yourself. That's, that's a difficult one. Take up a cross every day, your cross, and then follow. This is what I would like us to, that picture that I'd like us to have in regards to pursuit. What does that look like for us to deny ourselves or come to the end of ourselves? That visual is beautiful because we already know it with Christ going to the cross. You take up something that really, honestly, in a sense, can be a mockery. You take up something that could create for you persecution. People would want to shame you for that. All the while, Jesus says, it's the thing that you must do to pursue me. Yet I believe there is something absolutely glorious about the cross. What good is it, Jesus began to say in verse 25 of chapter 9, what good is it to gain the whole world and yet lose yourself or their souls? If you are ashamed of me, then I will be ashamed of you when I come in glory. Boy, those are, those are difficult words for us, aren't they? He didn't just say, follow me and not give a description of what it looks like to follow. No. He says, it looks exactly like this. And then Jesus predicts that some of them there standing would not die before they saw the kingdom of heaven. So after eight days of this kind of conversation, this takes place. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to a top of a mountain. And they're there to pray. Jesus quite does this, frequently pulling himself away to pray. And now they're being asked to join him. It's very reminiscent to the scene that happens just before he is seized by Roman guards. Before he is betrayed. To go away and to pray. But this, getting away, uh, this retreat, per se, is something glorious and significant and revealing. The other one is exactly what he had predicted, and it was one of grief and sorrow and pain, and yet still joy. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But we know this, that he takes them up there, and as they begin to pray, the scripture says they fall asleep, just like the garden. That's exactly what happens. When you spend the time that you spend, uh, they were fatigued and tired and they fell asleep. I cannot blame the disciples sometimes. Jesus knows his intent. He is one with the Father. And there's some practices that he's helped instigating disciples. He doesn't even criticize them for falling asleep. And yet they are awoken because Jesus is there in all his glory. The description by Luke is very similar to the description John makes in 1 John. In him there is no darkness. God is light. That same author in Revelation chapter 1, if you were to read that, the description of Jesus, this bright light, in some translations, particularly for Jesus in the moment, like lightning flashing. The brightest, the brightest light that you could think of. 
And he's there in that kind of glory. Not only that, Moses and Elijah are there. What a sight. And it's interesting, Luke lets us in on something. He lets us in on the conversation that is taking place. He says particularly that they were there talking, talking about what the end was going to be for him to exodus or to depart for the world. But what's very interesting is Peter gets to see something so magnificent, magnificent and so does James and John. You know, people always want to see Jesus. They want to, they want to get a glimpse of him, but for different reasons. Just before this, Herod was trying to get a chance to see. He kept trying to see Jesus. Later on, we know, particularly in Luke 28, or 23, 8, that he finally sees Jesus because he wants to see a miracle. There's a lot of people for various reasons who want to see Jesus. But they weren't all for the right reasons. Jesus invites a few in to see who he truly is. Because even though Peter uses the words he uses, and he has misunderstanding, as we'll see, Jesus can work with that. Why? Because he's in pursuit of God. That's different than one who is pursuing other things. I want to see something fantastic. God, show me something fantastic. That's not the way that works. People in pursuit of God are in pursuit of the heart of God. And Herod, he wanted to see. It was more important of, for him uh, to see miracles than it was to see who Jesus really was. And many people today want an audience with Jesus. Partly, maybe it's the whole, if Jesus could solve my problem thing. If I, if I could just get in a relationship with Jesus, maybe he'll solve my problem. Maybe I'll feel better. Or there was a moment in prayer or a time at which you surrendered or you thought you surrendered or you gave up something and there was a feeling that took place or transpired. We're not talking about feelings. We're talking about the truth. We're talking about what Jesus has already done for people. And people want to seek that outstanding feeling that happens when you come in the presence of somebody that does something spectacular. We want to be wowed all the time. Yes, Jesus absolutely wows us, but that, that wears off. Things of that nature wear off in our lives. We, we need more. It needs to be more spectacular. It needs to be more glorious. You know, there are a lot of songs, and we won't sing them, but almost, almost a sense that there's a movement even in the church that is crying out for God to show his glory in new ways. I'm going to let God decide, but all of his splendor is shown throughout the entire universe. It's already there, and it's in your life. His glory is already fully on display. They want to seek things now. Like, we want physical evidence that you're here, God. It's called the Holy Spirit, and it's called transformed lives. Jesus was different when he came onto the scene, absolutely different. And because of it, the way he loved, the way he cared, how he reached down and sat with the scum of the earth, how he spoke to those who felt like they were self-righteous, how he entered into a relationship with 12 who had really no there's no way in any other situation that they would have been following a rabbi, calling them out from where they were, uneducated, some of them, weren't qualified to be a representative for God, but he never, ever chooses the qualified. He chooses those who are in pursuit of him, that want to see him. You know, that's the thing that I think about Paul a lot. You know, we're like, well, what about Paul? Paul was trying to seek God with everything he had. He just was misguided about Jesus, and then what happens? Jesus founds him, and it all changes. And because of what we know now, our pursuit is God, Jesus Christ. That's what's taking place. Jesus is revealing these things, and it happens to be on a mountaintop. Now, Moses and Elijah appear very glorious here. They're glorified in, like, resurrected bodies, and they begin to talk with Jesus. And like I said, this discussion was purely around the way in which Jesus would depart, those things of departing for him, the exodus, how he would leave this world. It seemed like all of heaven knew that Jesus would die, but then he would rise again, and then he would send in glory and sit at the right hand of the Father. And so as they begin to talk about these things, 
Jesus was appeared to have this resurrected, ascended glory shown through him. It was that of things to come, fully God, fully human, but that of things to come, what he would look like in all his splendor. I'm trying to imagine what that sight was like because they had been around Jesus and something else was taking place that was out of the ordinary. Nobody had seen in this way resurrection. That I, I keep thinking, what does that look like the moment we move into glory? And I feel like part of the picture is here in the transfiguration. And that's what's happening. He is transfigured. The, the word here is, is, is metamorphosis. It's to be transformed. That is what's taking place. This is the appearance that the disciples see before them. They're awoken to this moment. And in this particular moment, Peter, like any other moment, reactionary, decides to give some input. Peter has one response, the only one that he could see through human eyes. And Scripture is very specific that Peter did not know what he was saying. He misunderstood the situation. It is wonderful for us to be here. A, a literal translation, it is wonderful for us to be here always. So here's the suggestion by Peter. Let us make some temporary shelters for all of you to memorialize all of you in this moment. There's a couple of things here that are very, very strange. He wants to honor all three, but as equals. We cannot idolize the things of the past nor place Jesus in the same place. We don't idolize Jesus. We worship him, we follow him, we listen to him. If we begin to idolize Jesus, we can make him anything we want him to be. And then we're following the wrong thing. That's why he makes it very, very clear of what it's like to follow him. To be able to set aside the self, die to self, to bear that cross, and to move forward in pursuit. Makes it very, very clear. And we're going to break that down in just a moment. But I want you to understand that in our human nature, we're much like Peter here. The suggestion he has is to remain in a place that seems satisfactory, that you're content with, something glorious. I was just talking with a friend of mine, and if we're not careful, we seek euphoria. We, we seek this ultimate pleasurable place. It's, that's our pursuit in everything. Our job, our relationships, our education, our entertainment, our fitness, all the things you saw described in that video, our pursuit gets to the place where we want it to be incredible. And the experience to be incredible. It means that we want that body that we think we should have without necessarily the result of hard work and exercise. So people offer things. Just have a couple of drops of this. Or take this pill. Or eat this particular diet. We, we want easy outs to get to a place that seems glorious in our lives. And I'm pretty sure you all agree with me. You see it in society all the time. Here's the easier thing. Heart, you don't have time to exercise? Take this thing. Really? There are, there are cheats all around us. I remember being in school. Anybody remember Cliff Notes? Whether you used them or not, I'm not condemning you. But that was like the easy way out. Let's not read the book. They'll just give you the essence of that book. That was a big thing. And Jesus is saying, that's not the way this works. This is sacrificial. This is a movement forward that, though seems difficult, requires work. It's for the benefit of you and this world. You know the best pounds to, pounds to lose are the ones that are lost very slowly? I say those are the ones that you keep off. That quick spurt and those other things, those are harder. 
or that fast fix, that's, that's much harder. It's better to be in a journey with disciplines along the way. It's not a quick fix, is it? It's a long, sometimes grueling process in our lives. But in this fast-paced society, we want it, and we want it now. Peter's saying, can we skip to the glory and the kingdom of God? Can we stay in that place? Let's just memorialize everything right now that we see. Let us go onto the mountaintop and remain there, for it is glorious. It is peaceful. It's majestic. I can't even set my eyes on the things that I see here. Let us stay here always. It is so beautiful. Folks, that's heaven. Did you hear me this morning? That's heaven. There are glimpses and there are times in this place in which we get to experience it. But that is not what we seek every day of our lives. Or it shouldn't be. Our pursuit is God. And then let him decide what that looks like. I have mountaintop experiences all the time. God's always reminding me, but the work is in the valley, Mike. It's where you minister. You don't get to just escape. Once you find Jesus, just escape and live this life that is granted to the fullest. That you feel like you're protected and everything is great and grand. Elijah and Moses, Moses particularly are there. And if a lot of scholars particularly talk about this, that you have the law, based on Moses, and the prophets there with Jesus. Jesus is not the same as those two. They were servants of the Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. So something happens and transpires to redirect Peter and the disciples that are there, the other two. And this cloud begins to envelop them. So now, you, now you're kind of understanding what is going on here. And it, it strikes fear in the disciples a bit. And I love this. The presence surrounds them. And from a voice, God himself, it says, this is my son. Don't call him equals with Moses and Elijah. My chosen one means the one to do the work of the Messiah. Listen to him. And then the scripture goes on to say they didn't tell anyone about it at that moment. These words fall upon one who is misguided and as the, as the author said, did not understand what he was saying. Jesus, through revealing his glory, Resurrected and ascended body was in a temporary moment, not in a permanent state. And it solidifies the claim that was made earlier by Peter himself that says, you are the Messiah. But what does it mean to be the Messiah? Peter might be requesting here to skip the cross. Even though he doesn't know or maybe understand even what that looks like or moving towards death, he was rebuked by Jesus earlier. When he said, no, 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 surely you won't die, Lord, and I won't let that happen. And he's like, get behind me, Satan. You don't understand what the Messiah must do. He just confessed Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And now there's this contradiction. To know Christ is to know the cross. Peter just didn't know what he was saying. And that's where God comes in and immediately responds. In other Gospels, Jesus tells them not to fear. But the presence of the Lord was surely there. This is my son, my chosen one. Again, Jesus is different than all others. Many in the, in the past have pointed out these things about Moses, John the Baptist, Elijah, the things that they, they, the things that they believed about them, that they carried the law or the word of God all the time. Jesus came according to the scriptures in Matthew 5 to fulfill those things, the law, the prophets. He didn't come to abolish them. So it's a, it's a beautiful representation of what Jesus does when Moses and Elijah had brought something to the people, a first covenant. Jesus is about to reestablish this relationship in a new, fresh way to all people with a new covenant, his body. That's what the Messiah has to do, to go to the cross. He has to die. We need death. So that we can live. 
This goes back to the words that Jesus uses about us picking up our cross. What's different about Jesus? The virgin birth, of course. Fully God, fully man. Neither Elijah nor Moses. He's the Savior of the world. But how? Yes, he healed people. John asked the question while he was in prison. John, John the Baptist asked the question. So is this the Messiah? Well, Jesus says, hey, go tell John what you've seen and what you've heard. He heals people. He loves people. He's going around this, this region in which he would eventually give up his body on a cross, but going around as much as he can, proclaiming the kingdom of God is here. And that he is the one that they've been waiting for. Jesus had to go, and he knew it. He had to go through the cross. That is what it meant for Jesus to be Messiah, the Christ. It's that he had to go through death. We have to go through the cross. This is what it means to follow the Messiah, the Christ. The only thing that solidifies us to bear the name Christian if you so choose because Jesus has found you and you receive it and you repent, you turn from your ways and you believe him as the son of God, this is what you're saying. I will do what Jesus asked me to do. And that is to take up your cross every day, denying yourself and to follow him. The last words that, Jesus, uh, that God uses in this moment is to listen to him. So what has Jesus told us? Well, what did he tell the disciples? Back to square one. Bear your cross. Don't be ashamed. I want to ask the question this morning, rather than always trying to figure out all the, when we talk about bearing a cross, number one, life has its difficulties. That is not your cross that you are bearing. The cross that you are bearing is self-denial. This is taking what you know of your life without God and setting it aside. So that you would know life because of God and through Jesus. That's what the symbolism is. It's, it's that you go to death every day. When Jesus walks this road carrying the cross or a criminal did, there was sort of shame on it. Clearly that person did something wrong. You're darn right we did. We're sinners. But saved by grace, the least we could do is to bear up this cross. Amen. And say, then God, I give you back everything. Everything that I am. And I follow you. Well, that sounds really vague. It is. Every day God reveals what that means for you. Bearing your cross isn't about what you can't do, but rather the things that you can do because Jesus went through the cross. I actually want to pose that question. So what can you do? What do you have? And then what will you do with it? Because Jesus went through the cross. I was thinking about how in, in a lot of our lives, we look for avoidance in this situation. We want to minimize the danger in our lives and in the causes that we wouldn't at that point bear the cross. There's this cartoon that I've seen, and maybe you've seen it. There's a little video. And if bearing our cross is, is, is denying our life, the self-centeredness of our life and accepting whatever life that God wants to give us as a result. There's a man and multiple others. Looks like they're walking through a desert, probably the desert of life, and they're all bearing their cross and they're walking. And at one point he stops. He's got the cross down on the ground and he looks up to God and says, can you, God, please make my, light, my cross lighter? It's too heavy. That's the prayer. You know what the next scene is? He's got a saw and he's cutting it himself. Sometimes we answer our own prayers, don't we? I don't know that it's a good thing. And so he seems to be content for a while. As he moves forward, it's still too heavy, so he looks up to heaven and says, God, please make this lighter again. No response from God, but rather he's got his saw out again, hacking at the wood. And he seems to be really content. And as you look at the cartoon, the multiple people, the masses, they all have their cross, the same cross to bear, the same one. 
I didn't talk about circumstances, did I? I didn't talk about the, the hand that you were dealt again. I didn't talk about the difficulties financially, relationally, in your health. Everyone experiences those to different degrees. Everyone has that same burden to bear their cross. And so there they have their big old cross and they're lugging it. And he's like, <laughs> with a little cross. They get to a ravine. And someone has a great idea. Let us use this burden, this cross. Lay it down that we might be able to get to the other side. They've all gotten to the other side. He shows up to the ravine and he realizes that burden cannot be laid down nor fill the void of the gap. In avoidance, our lives are not better. If Jesus were to avoid the cross, what would that have meant for us? No bridge across the great divide, that is us being sinful, God being holy, that means no relationship, and that means eternally lost forever. But because Jesus bore his cross, he created a bridge. How often are we trying to avoid the pain of bearing a cross and setting ourselves aside because of what we believe that would mean for us today? We only find ourselves that that ravine of life comes over, and had we faithfully bared our cross all along, there would be something glorious as a result. Not just for you, but for others. You can't even now help anyone to get over to the other side if you do not bear your cross. You aren't worth much in the way of helping someone heal. Giving them godly counsel, telling them about scripture and how good Jesus is. If you want to take the easy out and you want to avoid the pain of bearing your cross, it becomes disastrous. And you think that in that time it gives you great joy, and it doesn't. I have experienced my greatest joys as a result of taking up my cross. Because of the cross, I have disciplines and strength in my life that I have never, ever had. Do you realize again, whether I choose Jesus or not, there will be difficulties in this life. But in self-denial, God has given me a life that I could never dreamed of, especially disciplines and strength. He's given me perseverance. Why do I put that there? And there's a reason why. I was thinking about so often in my life, uh, there's things that I do that are that are just me doing it. I'm out there by myself. I have ridden this 34-mile-an-hour this 34 mile an hour, the 34 mile bike ride, this route by myself a bunch of times. I was out the other day with a friend, and there was a wind, and it was kind of the middle of the day. It was sort of beautiful, but we went on the ride together. When we were done, we looked at each other and said, wow, it wasn't like riding it by ourselves. In fact, we were noticing it along the way. Well, this is kind of grueling right here, but wow, we're doing this together. You know what we did? We rode side by side and we talked about life. We talked about God. We talked about difficulties. We talked about ministry because he's another pastor. And by the time we were done with that ride, we were like, what a beautiful moment. Yeah, I'm a little tired. I'm a little fatigued. I could use some rest. I'm going I'm to hydrate up a bit. But what a blessed ride that was. You know when I take that ride, what I do is I'm grinding the hill. Dear Lord, get me through this as fast as I possibly can. And then I recognized that same hill, I looked at my brother and I was like, so what's God doing in your church? And he started talking about, or we were just talking about all kinds of things came up as a result. Your endorphins are going and you're thinking, and we realized by the end of the time. And then we spent 45 minutes after the bike ride talking in front of my house. I don't, I don't do that on my own. I am given perseverance because I exist in a church that encourages me and supports me. I'm given perseverance by the Holy Spirit because he brings a brother into my life to journey with me. That's a beautiful picture. Where it was a grind and it was painful, it still is. I'm not saying the hills were easy. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying that, the, 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 uh, that there's no uh, similar workout happening. But our mind was on something else as we continued to journey and go through the pain together. It was a beautiful moment. I feel like that Perseverance for us is a gift that God's given us because the other people come alongside and we're on the journey together. 
I'm more successful on that ride. And I'll be honest with you, too. We were both talking about, we, we do these little apps, and they can kind of tell you these, these little moments of time of whether or not you've they've tracked your time on a particular hill, if you've done better or not. And we kind of rode with no intention to better our time, but just to enjoy the ride. And when we got back to my house, we looked at our apps, and we couldn't believe it, but we had set records for ourselves. Not trying to, but because we encouraged each other, and we were in this mode of, I don't know what it was. It was, it was like the, the, the time together made the other time that was painful be really bearable. And we were even forced each other to take breaks. This is a good time to stop and refresh ourselves and maybe eat a little bit, to hydrate a little bit. And I remember him saying afterwards, I love taking the breaks. And that's not something we normally do. Let's just grind this and get this thing over with. As a result, I can't tell you what transpired in our conversation, but the resulting factor is he has new vision for a church name and for a direction for his church because he was able to blurt that out in our conversation at some point, and he thinks this is totally of God. Because while we were grinding and doing the hard things and moving uphill and, and, and I guess sort of in a way through exercise bearing that cross a bit, but doing the hard thing, not the easy route. I, I told him we could have taken a route, the route that was a whole lot flatter. But because we did that, there was something at the end of that journey that God had done and sown in our conversation that ended up being beautiful and transformational, not just for me, but for him and potentially his church. That's the place God's called us to. That gives me great joy to know that God does that in the midst of difficulty of bearing our cross. Because the cross I have compassion and love where I had none, or I thought I had some, but a compassion and love for people. Because the cross I have gifts or talents that have come out of me as a result things that God's still trying to refine in me. I have the ability and the confidence to stand before the masses and proclaim the word of God, which I did not have ever. I have a call to serve now, serve people, serve a community, serve the hurting, even encourage the healthy along their way, their way and develop leadership because I've denied myself taking my cross up and I followed Jesus I have no shame, whereas before I would sit in a conversation, yes, even in the band days when we played a rock show and the day was, the, the concert was over and all these people want to talk to you, I just kind of froze there and I was like, oh, people don't ask questions about Jesus because I'm not prepared for that. And the Lord began to work on me and open those conversations and we began to pray and read scripture to people and lead people even off the platform to the Lord because he gave us boldness. And that shame of like wondering what people would think went away. And it doesn't matter what others say anymore. And then I have the Holy Spirit who empowers me and reassures me every day and gives light to the scripture. Who speaks into other people's lives and they pray for me and then they let me know the power that comes. Do you see the great joy I have as Jesus said the joy set before him? was to die, that that is the joy that is set before us, is to die because there's greatness ahead of us through God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who wants to give everything good to his people, to his children. That's the life we get to live when we set ourselves aside. So often we will try to uh, define this by the things that we can't do. There's nothing I can't do because that's my God. There are things that I would never think about doing because I serve a holy God. That's the beauty of it. And the things that God calls me to and the things that I get to live into do not create destruction, but they instigate life. Instigate life for my wife, for my kids. When I was a youth pastor, for all the kids there, when I've been in any kind of ministry, preaching the word of God, it instigates life for you. I walk away on a Sunday feeling completely satisfied. And I, trust me, I have my confidence issues in those type of things. And I'm, I'm wondering, did it, did it make a difference today, God? All the while, I trusted him because I set aside my feelings about what my voice sounds like. I've said that before. Or uh, my mannerisms or how unconfident I might come across as speaking. Oh, you know, it's kind of, that was a rocky 
speech, you know, he's kind of monotone too. You know, all the criticism that I might be thinking about, oh, that's, that scripture was said wrong. I ignore that and I listen to what God has me do, bring it before you, and I walk away on a Sunday and I have great joy and satisfaction that I did what God called me to do and I denied myself, picked up my cross, and I followed him today. What does that look like for you? There's got to be some application. You're gonna have, you got some notes and there's some questions I want you to think deeply about. There is an incredible future for us for sure, but we all have to go through the cross. We don't get to remain in this place on the mountain and skip to glory without having to go through some of the difficult things of picking up our cross daily and following Jesus. The cross is necessary. It was necessary for sin, so it must be necessary for us. To not pick up your cross is to deny the cross of Christ. We don't do that. We need that cross, right? That gives us life. Someone else needs us to bear our cross. It gives them life. We are going to be that church.